Hey guys, I'm back. So, there's been a lot going on, and you're all due for an update, so I'm just going to take you through all the updates so far, and what sh you should be expecting, um, and then we can get on to talking about this project. So first of all, I got a new mic. Oh, you probably can't see me. Yeah, I got a new mic! <laughs> Also, I built these really nice shelves to hold all my stuff and to uh, play hide and seek in. But it's nice if I'm if I'm looking for a specific board and uh, and just to pick it out for parts, and I can just slide through. So this weird ass thing that you see um, with all the wires hanging off of it, this is uh, supposed to be a uh, CNC machine. Uh, that you can attach a plasma cutter to and uh, and yes it does cut metal and it accepts g-code but uh, it doesn't work well enough for me to want to publish a video on it just yet I'm still waiting for parts so this is something to expect very soon first of all sorry about the lighting over here but I know many of you will be happy about this the co2 laser is making a comeback I'm going away from my experimentation on the CO2 laser and I bit the bullet and managed to buy a uh, 60 watt uh, laser power supply unit. It'll make my life a whole lot easier, it'll make this setup look much more professional and I'm planning on doing a video on it. But this will be um, in the future. This is not gonna be a video you should expect very soon. Alright so I think that was it. And let's finally get to this project. So this is really interesting. I took an old router that I had that would otherwise be thrown in the trash and I reflashed its firmware. Uh, meaning basically I just changed the software that the router was running on and that gave me access to its pins, to GPIO pins. And uh, since I had access to its pins, I desoldered uh, some lights and instead I made connections from those lights on the router to a relay and that relay therefore controls the outlet and you can therefore plug any appliance that you want into uh, this setup and you can control that appliance wirelessly. So the first thing that you need to do is find your specific router on the OpenWRT website. Now I know I have the first version of this router and uh, just as a side note, not every router will be supported. This is going to vary from router to router. So you have to do your research basically and just search up if this router is specifically supported on OpenWRT. Now I'm going to go under technical data here and click view edit data on the very first version of my router. Now that brings me to this page and it shows me all the important technical data of the router. Uh, but what's important is down here you'll see a firmware OpenWRT install URL and also a firmware OpenWRT upgrade URL. And the difference basically between the install and the upgrade images here is uh, not much actually because the install image is supposed to be used um, when you are changing from the original manufacturer firmware uh, into the OpenWRT firmware. And then once you have OpenWRT installed, then future upgrades can be just simply made with the upgrade image here. Uh, but both of these uh, images, both the install and upgrade images, contain the same information according to OpenWRT. So uh, basically, you should be able to just get away with installing the, the install image, and, and that's it. So after you turned on your router and you connected your Ethernet cable from your computer to one of your router's ports, uh, and also what I like to do is uh, turning off my wireless adapter in my computer to make sure um, my computer is using the Ethernet connection and not the wireless um, uh, connection. You can open up a browser and simply 
type in the IP address of the router in the URL box. Now obviously you are not going to see the same web page as me because I already flashed OpenWRT on this router. But once you're in, you need to find the option to upload new firmware. In this case, it was under my system settings. Then I found the firmware image I downloaded before and simply left it alone for 5 minutes. Once the new firmware is flashed, the router should reboot automatically. Now that flashing process was painless with no problems, but what if in your specific case with your router you are having problems and the image that you're trying to flash just won't work? Well actually this is where the USB to TTL adapter comes in and therefore I want to show you a different way of flashing your image. For this alternative flashing method, you need to connect the USB to TTL adapter to the UART pins on the router. Now the location of these pins will differ obviously in different routers, so you will have to do that research yourself. You'll have to figure out uh, where these pins are located on your router. And if your router is supported on OpenWRT, then most likely you will find that information. You, you should find a wiki that has pictures or at least some indication of where these pins are located. So this is how you connect your adapter to these pins. The ground on your adapter goes to the ground on your router. The TX signal uh, from your adapter goes to the RX pin on your router and the RX signal from your adapter goes to the TX pin on your router. All right, so when everything is set up properly, this is how it should look like. You have your ethernet cable that was connected from the previous uh, flash, and you have your new adapter connected over to the correct uh, UART pins. All right, so I'm gonna be doing this on Ubuntu, but this is basically the same exact procedure on Windows 7. I have uh, flashed images both on Windows 7 and on Ubuntu, and I find it's a little bit easier for, for me, at least, to do it on Ubuntu. Now, the first thing I'm going to type in is uh, D-M-E-S-G, uh, so D-Message, and that's going to give me information. Basically, what I'm looking for is this here, USB. So the PL2303 converter is now attached to TTY USB 0. And that information is important. It tells me um, basically what to type in. So now to interface with the adapter that we plugged into our computer, we type in the following sudo screen and we're linking the uh, adapter tty usb 0 um, and the baud rate is 115200 for this router and once you press enter oops uh, password okay once you press enter there you go, we have an empty screen. Now this means that you're in, that you're actually looking at what the adapter is seeing right now. Um, and my router is off right now, but once I turn on my, my router, you can see information. This information is basically the router booting up right now. So you can see we're in the shell of the router, but the reason we're doing this is because we want to interrupt this booting process. We want to interrupt this booting process only because uh, we want to get the router ready to accept the new firmware image. So how do you interrupt this booting process? Well, you have to turn on your router and once you turn it on and it starts to boot up, you have to press Control and C together rapidly. And Control C um, will interrupt the booting process. So I'll demonstrate that now. And there you go. You can see that um, startup has been canceled and we get this CFE prompt and we can uh, type stuff in. 
Now, CFE stands for uh, Common Firmware Environment. Now, in this um, environment, basically, you can uh, set up a TFTP server on the router to start listening for the new firmware image to be, you know, sent to it. So all we type in now is TFTPD and press enter and it should um, be reading right now. Um, there's also a green light that is um, consistently flashing on the router and uh, that is all to say that it's ready to receive the firmware image now. So this isn't usually an issue but I want to make sure I mention this because if you're doing this um, on Ubuntu like I am there's a little uh, I don't know bug or little problem that it, that is really weird when you try to uh, flash the firmware image onto the router and uh, and it basically has to do with the name of the image um, so you see how long uh, the name of this image is now Apparently when you try to send this image file over to the router it causes problems um, So basically all I'm saying is you have to rename this to something shorter I like renaming it to code.chk and that works just fine. All right So now what we do is type in TFTP we should get a different prompt and we connect over to our router and then we want our mode to be binary we want to send the file over in binary now that's all you really need to do in terms of configuration but in addition to this what i like to um, set up is time out 60. All that basically does is forces TFTP to keep retrying to send over the file. Um, I turn on verbose and that just gives me more information on the console and we want trace. Um, to trace the packets that are going over. And now we can actually send the file over. And now when I press enter, the file should be sent over. And there you go, you can see all the packets being sent and received. And you can see on our other screen, we have, um, we have an indication that the router has received all the, all the packets and it is programming the information that we sent it, the image that we sent it. And when it's done programming, it will simply reboot like normal and yeah, set everything up. All right, so now assuming you have successfully installed OpenWRT on your router, we can finally get to the meat and potatoes of this project and getting to exactly how to set up a GPIO pin and manipulating it. Now, first of all, it should be noted that you can access the shell of the router, like you see here, uh, via the USB to TTL adapter, or you can do it via the Ethernet cable, or you can do it uh, wirelessly via the wireless network. And uh, both the Ethernet cable and doing it over the wireless network requires you to SSH into the router so keep that in mind i personally like to use the usb to ttl adapter to access the shell directly now before we get into setting up the pins we have to know what pins exist because how are you going to set up something that you don't even know exists so we have to basically gather information on the pins that exist on this router and to do that we type in the following cat system kernel debug and GPIO and that should give you a list of GPIO pins available on the device. You can see that the GPIO chip 0 has GPIO pins 0 through 15, GPIO chip 1 has GPIO pins uh, 32 through 47. So keep those numbers in mind. Those are important. All right, so I want to show you something. If we do ls, uh, system class GPIO, press enter, and that should list 
everything in the GPIO folder, which is um, export the two GPIO chips and unexport. And export is actually what we're interested in because when you write a number into export, it will automatically set up a GPIO pin associated with that number that you wrote into export. So this is how you set up the GPIO pins. Now remember, we know the range of numbers, uh, the range of GPIO pins available on the device. So we know which numbers to write into export. And to set up those GPIO pins. And just through trial and error, I figured out that pin 10 and pin 11 are both located at the dome of the router, the top of the router. So we're going to be uh, using pin 11 for this example, but pin 10 uh, I already used to set up the, the relay and um, all those lights associated with pin 10 are desoldered. So you won't see anything light up. That's why I'm using pin 11. Now that writes GPIO 11 into export. And actually, if we do ls system class GPIO, press enter, now we see GPIO 11. It automatically set up that pin. And uh, if we go into GPIO 11, we'll see value, direction, we'll see all these different options to set up that specific GPIO pin and that will make it an output. And as soon as we do that, there are lights that uh, lit up on the router. These two blue lights are associated with pin 11. Now to turn on and off the, the pin, we can echo either a one or a zero into its value parameter. So system class GPIO GPIO 11 and value. And there you go. Now some pins may be inverted, so a one will turn them off and a zero will turn them on uh, and vice versa for other pins. But I can show you right now that uh, those pins are off. So now I can comfortably turn on and off uh, those two pins. I can control those two pins, turn them on and off and if you can do this from the command line, you can also do this in a script file, which we're going to get to next. So as for the script itself, I highly recommend you start a text file on your desktop and just start writing your code in that text file uh, because you can write your code uh, in the shell itself, but it's risky uh, just because, you know, if the router turns off or, or something like that, uh, well, it's not always guaranteed that your code will be saved. Uh, so just keeping it on a text file on your computer is much safer, and uh, sometimes you can use programs to uh, check your code too, so that's always helpful. Anyway, Anyway, let's get to the code itself. So these two first lines set up the pin. Now you notice the, the pin that we're talking about is pin 10, but uh, we're gonna be changing that to pin 11. And uh, all we're doing here in this loop, because this loops endlessly, um, is we're reading for information. So uh, the router is waiting for information from my computer. It's waiting for key presses. And it's looking specifically for um, number one and number two here. And if those keys are pressed on my computer, it will uh, then go to this if statement and it will execute uh, this line of code, which we know from uh, you know previously setting up a, a GPIO pin by ourselves that it will turn the pin on and off respectively. So now what we can do is actually create that file that uh, contains the code that we want to execute. And this is how we do it. We type in echo um, and then our shebang. Now you can research what the shebang is exactly, but it basically just uh, is at the top of every script file uh, just so that script file knows where the 
the bash is located at. Um, and that will make sense if you research, research it yourself, but I won't get into that. It's just a necessary part of the script. Uh, anyway, uh, you can start off uh, to make this file by um, echoing or writing in this, uh, this shebang into the file that you want to create. And we're specifically putting our file in the um, etc. folder. Now, this is important because you can put your script file anywhere that you want. We could actually create a script file um, in the directory we are in right now. But uh, the problem with that would be that if the, if the router reboots, then that script file will be uh, gone. It'll, it'll just disappear. So we want um, our script file to be in a place where it will be saved. And that's why we can put it in the um, etc. folder, or we can put it uh, in, the, in the path, uh, or you know wherever you want that, that you know it will be saved upon reboot. Now the name of our script file is obviously lights.sh. And if we press enter, it will be made. All right, so now that we made our script file, we obviously have to edit it somehow. So I'm using VI. Uh, VI is a well-known uh, but complicated uh, text editor. Uh, Nano is also a text editor and it's much easier to learn how it works, but I prefer using VI. We hit enter and then uh, obviously we see our shebang at the top that we wrote into our file at, at the beginning, but to start editing we have to press I and once we press I, we press enter, and then uh, you can see at the bottom it's uh, in parentheses modified. So now we can actually uh, go and start typing stuff in. So this is where the code from our, uh, from our text file on our desktop comes in, into play. Uh, we can paste all that code into here, and bam, we have a script file. <laughs> we just make our appropriate edits, and we're good to go. Now that I'm done with all the edits, we can uh, save this file. And to save, we hit escape. And then we press the shift and colon key. And after that, we press W and then press enter. And that will write in uh, or set in all of the changes that we made. Then we can press shift colon again and uh, press Q and enter and we will be back at the shell. Now to also confirm that we have indeed uh, saved the file correctly, what we can do is check um, if, the, if the code is present by doing cat, etc., and then lights.sh. And all that code is present, uh, is there. So indeed we have done everything correctly and we just have to give this script file permissions uh, in order to execute. So to give executing permissions to our script file, we do uh, chmod plus x and then uh, you know the path to our script file. Pressing enter, we'll do that. And once we do that, we can execute our script. So we can execute our script by typing in sh and uh, the path to our script file. And there you go, resource busy. So that means it's actively waiting for input uh, from my computer, which, uh, you know, if you remember, was those key presses that I was talking about. It's waiting for uh, me to either press a one or a two. So if I press either one or a two, I have complete control, complete control over the lights. And now you know how the relay works or how I control the relay. Uh, instead of controlling the lights in this fashion, uh, it's just the relay. But it's the exact same code and it's the exact same thing. Uh, I'm just showing you lights because, you know, lights are easier to see. <laughs> 
So speaking of the relay, here's how everything is connected together. This is the entire circuit schematic. And I want you to notice two things from this. So first of all, I didn't need a pull down resistor in my case, but in your case it may be different. So just be aware of that. And uh, the other thing is you need to be very careful with your MOSFET selection. When you pick out the MOSFET to use in this circuit, uh, you have to make sure that it has a low on resistance. Uh, it has to be, uh, well preferably, uh, it has to be around uh, half an ohm. Uh, so the on resistance uh, should be less than an ohm for sure, but uh, if it's around half an ohm, then it would be uh, perfect for this application. Um, and that really has to do with the fact that the router cannot provide a lot of current uh, through its uh, light connections, through its LED connections. And that's what we're connecting to, right? Because it cannot provide a lot of current, uh, it makes it harder for uh, it to switch the MOSFET on and off properly if the MOSFET has a high on resistance. So that's why it's important to select a MOSFET like this MOSFET um, that is currently named uh, that has a low on resistance and it makes the circuit work uh, beautifully. Once you set up a wireless network on the router and are connected to it, you can SSH into the shell and control anything you want, however you want. I had a lot of fun playing around with the range of the network too. I think that's pretty much it for this project. Uh, one thing worth mentioning though is that this is not the full capabilities uh, or functionality uh, that you can get out of this router. Uh, there is so much more you can do with this uh, other than just uh, turning some lights on and off. Uh, of course you can uh, program uh, more complicated uh, bash scripts if you wanted to but there are also packages that you can download uh, either straight from the URL uh, web page of the, of the router itself or you can do it straight from the SSH command line in, in the shell. So you can search for specific packages that give you um, the ability to uh, communicate with chips. For example, uh, you could download this uh, I squared C package uh, for the router and that uses up uh, two GPIO pins and in return you could communicate with uh, you know chips using I squared C which is amazing. Uh, you have the ability to connect an Arduino or motor controllers to this router and you could literally build a uh, Wi-Fi controlled robot uh, you know on wheels or I've even seen a person take this as far as building a drone out of this. So uh, can you imagine uh, the latency issues that a person would have trying to pilot a drone uh, wirelessly off, off Wi-Fi so uh, that, that was very interesting. I'll post all the links in the description so you can uh, check them out but I think this uh, is more than just uh, something for home automation. You could, uh, you could essentially make this a development board for anything that you want to create and I think the fact, the overall fact that you're uh, reusing this router, uh, reusing this technology in a way that it was I guess never meant uh, to be reused is really cool for me at least. Um, I think above all else uh, this saves it from the landfill and it's always good to reuse something uh, and repurpose it rather than uh, completely recycling it. So there you go. So as always thank you for watching and I hope you learned something and I'll see you in the next one.